Hello and welcome to our 150 Years of Women exciting special women's tour here at UC Berkeley. We are so excited to present um, some really interesting history of women's presence at Cal and we have some really exciting stories to share with you all so I'm really excited to dive in. I'll start off by introducing myself. Um, my name is Evelyn. I am a campus ambassador here or a tour guide, you could say. Um, I use the pronouns she, her, and hers, and I'm originally from a town called Belmont, California, about 40 minutes away from Berkeley. Um, I'm a senior and I'm double majoring in psychology and legal studies, and I'm involved in a few things around campus. So um, previously I worked as a resident assistant at International House. Um, I have been involved Involved in the ballet company at Berkeley for all of my time here. Um, I really love learning the French language, so I've worked as a tutor for French 1 and 2, and this semester I'm also um, a mock witness in a depositions class at Berkeley Law, so that's a little bit about me. But now I'll go over a little overview of how today will go. So we will have a 45 minute presentation for you all and you are free to type questions in the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen and we have a whole team of campus ambassadors who are excited to answer your questions um, so definitely utilize that Q&A function. We will also be recording this special tour so you can go back and revisit some of this information if you're interested. Um, and it will go over a historical overview. Um, it's in conjunction with the 150 years of women's celebration, and it is from the student perspective. We will end our presentation with a live Q&A session with our two presenters, where we'll do our best to answer all of your questions. So again, utilize that Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brianna and Christy, our two guides. Hello everybody, um, my name is Christy. I use the pronoun she, her, and hers. And I'm originally from Seattle, Washington and came down to California to start college four years ago. So I'm a senior this year, we'll be graduating really soon. And I'm doing a double major in political economy and linguistics. Um, so on campus, I play for the Women's Ultimate Frisbee team. I do research, um, URAP is our formal research apprenticeship program. And then of course I do research through 150W, which is really what I'm gonna be presenting on today. Um, I'm part of academic clubs for both of my majors, so SLUGS is the Society for Linguistic Undergraduates and PISA is the Political Economy Student Association, and this year I'm the curriculum chair for that. And I'm also part of outdoor and climbing clubs here at Cal. Thanks so much, Christy. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianna. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. I am from San Diego, California, and like Christy, I'm also a senior here at UC Berkeley. I study economics here, and some of my extracurricular activities include research, the Britannian Women's Honor Society, Berkeley Women in Business, and Smart Women Securities. But by far, one of the most fulfilling and the highlight of my undergraduate career has definitely been my involvement in the 150 years of Women at Berkeley celebration. And I'm really excited to be diving into everything about 150W with you all today. And so today we'll be covering a few key topics. You know, Christy will be diving into the pioneering women of Berkeley and the history of Berkeley women that have paved the way for us. And I'll touch on later in the presentation on the current Berkeley women that are continuing to pave the way for the next generation and talking a little bit about those early modern achievements and celebrating 150W. So I'll give it over to Christy to take it away. All right, so to kick off this tour, I want to officially welcome everybody to the celebration of 150 years of women at Berkeley. And this year we've been doing all kinds of different events, both kind of on the contemporary side. So we've been um, partnering with the women's basketball team. We've been creating various inclusive logos. And we've also been kind of working more on the historical side, which is really where my involvement with this project kind of came in. Um, so my original project that I proposed was I was really interested in daily life of women's students throughout um, the years that we've been at Berkeley. And I was interested actually in creating a kind of um, a 
research um, paper uh, daily schedule for a woman every single decade that we've been students. So that would have been kind of like 15 research um, papers all together. And I got through about four of them before the library shut down and I did not have any more access to the university archives. Um, so this presentation is really built off that research that I was able to do when I was on campus in early 2020. And I've used some amazing um, uh, secondary sources to sort of fill in the holes that I wasn't able to find. So I used, you know, the Daily Cal, um, the History Department, the W150 History Project. They've put out some amazing research this year. So we're going to be kind of talking about this original primary source research that I did. And then also I'm going to be filling it in with some more secondary sources. All right. So if anybody is familiar at all with Cal history, you've probably seen this specific piece of history before. And this was the date that women were first admitted into the university through a decision, decision by the UC Regents. And this reads that young ladies should be admitted into the university on equal terms in all respect with young men. So 150 years ago, pretty much um, from the state. And um, that year, 17 women initially enrolled at the university, and I'd like to highlight two of them. So Rosa Scrivener was the first woman to graduate from Berkeley in four years after she enrolled, and she graduated with a PhD in agriculture. In agriculture, or, um, and PhD is a um, bachelor, baccalaureate in philosophy, so we don't really use that term as much anymore. Um, and you can actually see this is a photo, um, a photo I took in the library, this um, bottom photo on the screen of her in the university kind of um, archival records. And so this surprised me, actually. Um, I saw, actually, throughout this time, a lot of women were doing kind of science degrees, agriculture degrees, various STEM degrees. And this is kind of a flip from what we see today when we have a lot of issues with kind of gender equality, especially in the sciences and engineering. So I did some more research and I actually found out that it was quite common for women to study STEM fields at the time because the prestigious degrees were actually seen um, as like law, philosophy, Latin. Those are the things that kind of like were the most prestigious degrees you could get. So women kind of went into the STEM fields because they were seen as less prestigious. And then as time went on, this sort of flipped and we get kind of the gender equality that we see today, um, you know, completely different. But I think that's just a fascinating piece of history that probably not a lot of people People know about Cal's women. A lot of us initially were STEM majors. Um, and so the second woman I'd like to highlight today is Melissa Wasburn Shin, and she graduated in 1898 with a PhD in education. So she was the first woman to graduate from Berkeley with a PhD. And she went on to a wonderful degree, um, a career in education. So she was a teacher the rest of her life. But something that's really important to highlight is her dissertation that she wrote at Berkeley actually became a founding document for the field of developmental psychology. And it's still used today in classes and in textbooks. Um, so while she didn't continue on in education, you know, the initial work that she did is just like groundbreaking and phenomenal. Um, and she did that while, you know, she was studying at Berkeley. All right, so um, during the early years of Cal's history, and you would know this also if you've studied the university history at all, really student life was formed around traditions. And we still have you know, a lot of traditions as Cal students today, but especially back then, this was so important in creating kind of student culture. Um, there was a lot of hazing. So, you know, uh, sophomores kind of um, hazing freshmen was very common, um, various kind of like initiation rituals that would kind of be frowned upon today. And you can see a photo. Um, this is from the 1930s, but this kind of thing was happening from the beginning of the university. Um, and there was also a lot of sporting rituals. So this would be like the junior class versus the sophomore class had like an intercollegiate football match. And going along with these sporting rituals, there would be, you know, drinking, smoking, rowdy, pregame kind of like um, gatherings. And really none of these were places that young women would be kind of accepted or young women were expected to participate. Um, they were very rowdy, very like boys club. And you can see that, you know, it was pretty an, an exclusionary student culture. Um, and nothing kind of um, exemplifies this more than this description that I found in a very early kind of account of the university's history. Um, so I'll read this out loud. This was a lunchroom that was initially in North Hall. So it was written, for those who brought food from home, a lunchroom was outfitted in the basement of North Hall, but it became a campus disgrace. Benches were broken in roughhousing, walls were stained in evidence of fiercely fought apple core bottles, and other equipment in the room was in general disarray. 
And again, this really doesn't seem like an environment where a young woman in the late 1800s, you know, it would not have been acceptable for her to be in that room. So I have to wonder, where did the women students eat lunch, you know, if they brought food from home, um, you know, what places on campus were they accepted. And, you know, definitely there were many parts of the student culture and parts of the campus where it was not acceptable to be a young lady for a very long time. So it must have been, you know, a pretty um, isolating experience to be a woman student in the early years of the history of the university. So women were not only facing exclusion in kind of student culture and student life, there was actually formal policies to exclude women from certain classes. And this is very interesting. Um, so Charles Gailey was one of the first professors in the English department. He was huge in like expanding the university and kind of putting it on the map. He's a huge figure in Cal history. So I read his biography and was surprised to find that he actually had formal policies for excluding women from certain classes that he gave, which were very popular. So they had long waiting lists, they were hard to get into. Um, so if sometimes he made it so that women had to take certain prerequisites that men did not have to take. So you had to do like two years of freshman English while men could just enroll in the class freely. Another example, he gave a very popular lecture class on great books. That's what the lecture title was called. And it was so popular that it had a long wait list and women were put to the back of that wait list. So they could only enroll in the class if men, you know, if there was room after all the men's students had enrolled. And in this same class, actually, it was so popular that um, there wasn't enough seats in the lecture hall for people to sit. So Charles Gailey kind of encouraged the female students to, to either stand outside the lecture hall and look in in the windows to the class, you know, and take notes or stand in the back of the lecture hall and take notes so that the men could sit down. And this was because he believed that, um, you know, men had a very like physically demanding day. They were playing sports. They were, you know, doing physical labor and they needed to like sit down and rest their feet. And we all know, um, you know, women's work at the time was extremely physical as well. This was before the washing machine was invented. Um, so I can imagine that like the women were just exhausted on their feet, you know, standing in the back of their classroom trying to take notes for an English class. And we can also see physical education, um, vastly different opportunities for women for a really long period of time. So women didn't have rights to use the gym until the late 1890s. And this is actually one of the very first examples that we have of Cal students advocating for themselves. And we know this is a huge part of our student culture you know, today, but really one of the first times we see this is when the young women of the university advocated for their rights to use the gym in the late 1800s. And eventually they won their rights. They were able to use the gym one day a week and only after the men's track team was finished practicing. Um, and eventually a women's gym would have been, you know, would be built, but that was not for some time. And then we can see also, so I had a really fun time looking through all the old course catalogs and women's um, physical education offerings were significantly different than men's. And this was until, you know, the seventies, the eighties that this was happening. So this was a 1954 course catalog. There's a photo on this slide. And we can see that, you know, the courses for women are really things like tennis, you know, badminton, um, social dancing, uh, maybe some archery. And the men's course is gonna be everything from weightlifting to football to, you know, boxing and wrestling and all these other offerings. So women had a severely kind of like a limited physical education offering. So within these kind of spaces of exclusion, women, you know, eventually began to create their own spaces on campus. And this was really kind of spearheaded by Lucy Sprague, who was the first official dean of women. And she came into the university in the very early 1900s. You know, she was a force. She was this very young, energetic, you know, modern woman of her time with a lot of ideas. And she wrote in her biography, which was an excellent read. Um, so she wrote, this really exemplifies the kind of work she was doing that as a group, women were tolerated in a man's college. I wanted them to create something that was their own, something that would give them standing in their own eyes and in the eyes of their community. And she did that um, through several different kind of ways. So she opened her home to all freshman women students every single Wednesday to come and have tea and to chat with her. And I can imagine this would have been, you know, such a community building activity to go after class with your friend and you get a walk to the dean's house and she serves you tea and it's all cozy and comfortable. Um, that would have been just a really special kind of memory and time. 
And she also would host poetry readings at her house. And eventually she actually encouraged the women students to start reading their own original poetry. So it became something of kind of like a, a shared collaborative environment where people were writing poems and stories together. And um, she actually decided, she heard all these stories and poems when women were writing that they should share them publicly. And so this began what was called um, the Parthenia and which took place between 1912 and 1931. And this was an annual pageant put on by Berkeley's female students. And they wrote it themselves every year. They kind of like wrote a script and voted on what script they wanted. And they put together costumes, dances, music. It was a really elaborate event. Um, thousands of women worked on it every single spring. And it was typically held in like faculty glade around that area. So you can see photos from um, Parthenia throughout the years. And um, towards the end, they had people coming from San Francisco, Oakland, like people flocked to the Berkeley campus to watch, you know, Berkeley's, you know, female scholars put on this pageant, this performance, um, which is just, you know, amazing to think about, um, kind of sad it went away. So, um, and around the same time also, um, in 1901, um, the Pretanian Women's Honor Society was founded. And this is still, you know, happening today. And um, Brianna is part of it. So this is a really excellent example of how like women's academic excellence is continuing to be celebrated. So women's housing options were pretty limited around this time. And this kind of like added on to the already difficult experience they had as you know college students at Cal. Um, so I found some amazing descriptions that I'd like to read a couple um, that kind of just show the dire circumstance of women's housing. So Dr. Mary Ritter was one of the very first like champions of women students at Berkeley, you know, really in the very end of the 1800s. Um, so she describes in her biography, um, female students living in rented rooms without plumbing or running water, windowless basements, even sheds and backyards. And she advocated for more sanitary living conditions and better support systems through her whole time there. But there was really not a whole lot of support in place for women to find housing. And most boarding houses weren't going to be taking women students. So it was very difficult. Um, so Lucy Sprague came in and she, you know, was the first official champion for women's rights on campus or, you know, a, a rights in the student experience. Um, so her description in the 1910s um, goes like this. So she writes, one of my first practical jobs was to visit boarding houses and make out an approved list. I met every kind of boarding house lady, some who took a few highly recommended girls to florid blonde ladies who ran houses for prostitutes who periodically turned up registered as students. Um, so that really sent my mind thinking like these women who were boarding in prostitute houses, I'm not sure if they were boarding there or if they were also working there. And on top of that, having the rigorous schedule of a Cal student, their, their lives, like they must have been just amazing women. Um, so, um, most students, actually, most women students that I saw kind of listed on the register, a lot of them ended up commuting um, from home or living with a relative and commuting from there. And this was a tough commute. You can see the stagecoach um, from 1870, the year that women were first admitted um, on the slide. And um, women would also take the ferry in from San Francisco. Um, this was a pretty long and pretty arduous commute. So they were coming pretty far to, you know, get a college education. Um, but it really shows that, you know, a Cal education was kind of limited to women who were connected in the area or who could really kind of like step out of their comfort zone. Um, for rural women or for women who lived in different parts of California, it would have been a lot harder to achieve an education at this time because there wasn't a lot of support to um, uh, house um, women and to kind of like build a community for them. So um, talking about like the various housing options throughout history. So um, uh, Lucy Sprague, we can see in her writing, she eventually did make a list of approved boarding houses. And this would have been sent out with the admissions package to any female student who was admitted to Berkeley. So she had some idea of where she could begin to think about where she would be living. Um, we can also see around this time, university clubhouses began popping up. And these are kind of like um, university sponsored co-ops to the modern day co-op system. And um, they were typically, you know, people would live together, cook, um, clean um, their sort of households. And I found some great accounts, um, some really um, just wonderful accounts of men's boarding houses or men's clubhouses and women's clubhouses um, exchanging kind of services and goods. So the one I found was a um, men's boarding house went to help the women's boarding house um, repair some items and they built them a new deck. And then the women's boarding house 
um, helped the men by um, darning all their socks and doing some like repairs for their clothes. And, um, you know, from the description, um, they talked about how a lot of really great friendships came out of these relationships and, you know, some marriages as well. So it, it seems like a really great community. Um, Later on, uh, sororities also became a um, way that women could live in Berkeley. Uh, they tended to be a little bit more exclusionary, and we'll talk about this a bit more later, but um, you tended to need like a, a letter of recommendation. They would only kind of accept the most well-connected women. Um, so that was an option for some. And eventually, we, um, Berkeley would open its first dormitory for women in 1942. And this still remains a housing option for female identifying students today. And this is um, Stern Hall, which is the yellow building on the screen. So, so after these women graduated from Berkeley, they had quite um, a few less career options than you know I do today and other um, women students do today. So as for traditional paths, um, marriage was a very common result of coming to college, and this really you know went on until well until like the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. Uh, Lucy Sprague wrote in her biography how um, you know most women she wrote came to college to have a good time and to meet a husband. And she was really striving to show women that they were different doors that you know they could um, explore. And she wanted to give them an experience outside of that. So create their own kind of like female led spaces on campus. Um, women also frequently applied for teaching certificates. At one point in the early 1900s, up to like 90% of women were applying for teaching certificates. And I found a wonderful book um, that I read called Equally in View, The University of California, It's Women and Schools by Geraldine Clifford. And she actually has a very interesting thesis where she writes that these women who were coming from Berkeley, getting teaching certificates, and then spreading out throughout California and becoming high school teachers were actually one of the reasons that Cal succeeded and became such a powerhouse because at the time, this is hard, you know, for people to imagine, especially undergrads like myself, but Cal had a really hard time um, attracting qualified students. So we didn't have enough freshman applicants. We were in danger of being shut down early on. So it was these, you know, highly educated Berkeley women who were going out and becoming teachers that actually inspired, you know, and taught the next kind of generation of people who would come to Cal and start to study here. So it's really like these women who were teaching that helped bolster the university kind of from the bottom, um, which is pretty amazing. And a lot of these women also end up in um, top level administration systems for the California public schools. So they really built the school system that we have here today. Um, I also would like to point out, so these were very traditional paths that many women followed. There are many examples of women following non-traditional paths into research and academia. So we already spoke about Melissa Wasburn Shin, who was the first Cal PhD and her kind of like foundational work in developmental psychology. Um, we also have examples. Um, there is a woman named Jessica um, Pixoto, and she was Cal's second female PhD. So she joined UC Berkeley faculty as a sociology lecturer in 1904. And she eventually moved to economics and she became Cal's first female professor and first female department head and she graduated or she retired that is in 1935. Um, we also have Annie Dale Beidel and she um, graduated with a PhD in mathematics in 1911. There's another, you know, a STEM woman um, coming out of Cal early on. And so she was a mathematics professor at Cal until 1935 as well and published many kind of um, uh, pieces of original research during her time here. It's also really important to note that many women were facing barriers on multiple fronts. So not just because of their gender, but because of their racial and ethnic and religious identities. Um, so there's a story that I found that is, you know, absolutely mind blowing. So Ida Louise Jackson is a huge figure in Cal history. We have a um, graduate housing building named after her today, the Ida Louise Jackson Graduate House. Um, so she founded Alpha Kappa Alpha in 1921, which is the first um, black woman's sorority on campus. And that year they all got together and they took a yearbook photo and they paid actually $45 for this photo, which was a lot of money back at the time. And you can see the original yearbook photo up on the screen. Um, so at the time, um, you know, they brought the photo to the yearbook and they were actually denied a space in the yearbook because 
they um, were told that they did not like uh, represent the university. They did not look like the other rest of the students. So this group of women were experiencing, um, you know, uh, barriers on just so many fronts, you know, because of their gender, because of their racial identity, they were kind of being denied spaces at Cal. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. Um, we can also see this in housing discrimination for students of color and also for Jewish students. So I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but especially with fraternities and sororities, um, you know, women who are of color, women who um, were really not Christian, um, were not going to be accepted into those spaces. And that was a major way that especially female students could get housing at the time. So this was really, really tough. And um, so a lot of these students actually kind of created their own separate clubs. So a big example that I found was the Japanese Students Club that was created in 1939. And they had their own house where they kind of boarded students. Um, but in the house, they only accepted men students. So if you were a Japanese woman coming here, you were being excluded from you know, the sororities and then the um, club that was kind of closer to your identity only housed um, men students. So I can imagine like that must have just been such a headache to try to figure out, you know, you're facing you know, so many barriers in so many different areas. So now I want to get into really my passion when I started this research and that was kind of like these little slice of life moments in daily life of women's history. And I just have always found this kind of history so fascinating and I was so excited to research, you know, different kind of like daily life, like what, it, what would a day look like for a woman at Cal. Um, so one of the first accounts that I found was a, um, a notebook that was written by Julia DuPont, who was a freshman in the year 1921. And this is actually a photo of her first impressions piece right there. Um, as you can see, I had to learn to read some pretty hefty cursive to get through these sources. I read diaries, I read letters, I read scrapbooks. Um, so that was kind of fun, you know, as a girl of the 21st century, not used to that as much. Um, but in her first impressions piece, she wrote that her first impression of Cal, so her very first day as a student here, was full of long waiting in lines and a frightful amount of hills and stairs. And I love, you know, pieces of information like this because we think of the past as such a different place. Um, but then we get things like this. And I think, you know, my first year here in, you know, August of 2017, I probably had the exact same first impression of Cal, like a lot of lines and a lot of stairs. Um, so that was really fun to kind of connect with her over, you know, a hundred plus years of history. And the diary that I really kind of got into, and I really read most of it, so um, was written by a woman named Edda McHugh, who was a student about 30 years earlier than we saw Julia DuPont. So she was a student here in the early 1890s, so 18 kind of 94, 95. And I had a, just an amazing time reading her, you know, everyday diaries and her accounts. Um, so I'd like to share just a couple entries with you that I think are super fascinating. So um, she talks about class registration on January 16th, so the first day of the new semester. And so she writes on this day, I went to college this morning at 8.30 a.m. Hereafter, I shan't go back until 9.45, except on Saturdays, as Latin has been changed to 2.50, which makes it conflict with my German lecture. As might be expected, I don't think I could get through the day without managing some sort of conflict. So she's writing something that really all Cal students are still feeling when you sign up for a class and then the time changes and it conflicts with something else and you're just like, dang, my schedule is so perfect. So that was just so fun to read and be like, man, <laughs> that, that, that feeling, you know, that still is around. We still feel that. Um, so she also writes a lot, and I think this is extremely important, about the sheer amount of studying that she did as a student here. So she, um, I think a lot of time women's college experiences are kind of represented in like their dating life and their social lives and like the clubs that they were doing. Um, but it's also important to remember that these women were Berkeley students and this was, you know, the, one of the most rigorous academic educations you can get and it still is. And it was really refreshing to read in Adam McHugh's diary how much she was studying. Um, so I want to pick out an entry on January 24th um, and she wrote, um, got up this morning at seven to study for an exam in geometry, went to the library to study, didn't accomplish as much as I wanted to, didn't have quite an hour and spent a good half of that talking to Miss Sullivan and then to Doris. Pretty nearly everyone besides me had crammed a great deal for the exam, whereas I had not crammed hardly at all. 
didn't do so well as I usually do in math exams. So that was kind of a, a bummer in that case, but that's a very relatable event also. Um, going to the library, seeing your friends, trying to cram for an exam, getting distracted. Um, but she really, she writes about studying quite a bit, almost in every entry. At one point she, she skips a Valentine's Day social so she can study for a Latin exam, which is another experience I think most Cal students have kind of experienced in some way. Um, and then finally, one of the most fun things that I got to read about was her various boating and hiking adventures around the Bay Area. And it was so cool because these are things that I do with my friends and, you know, other Cal students are still doing. Um, so one that she wrote about was on February 7th, and she writes that her friend kind of sought her out in the library and asked if she could go on a boating party that evening um, down at the UC Boathouse, which I believe is still kind of down there in the marina. And so she had to go ask her mom because, you know, you needed permission from a guardian at that age. She was an unmarried young lady. And um, she got this permission, so she went down to the boathouse and she met her friends um, and her a friend's sister, Ned, Allen, all these guys, um, and she writes that the night was all that it should be, with a brilliant moon, company lively, warm, and the water was just like glass. Um, and one of the men brought a guitar and someone else brought a flute and they were out there singing college songs and um, just enjoying kind of like goofing off and being in this boat together. And I just think that's just, it's an incredible description. It shows that she had a really vibrant social life and, you know, she was having, she was doing this intense studying and she was hanging out with friends and her life was very different than ours. But at the same time, she found some of that special kind of magic that makes Berkeley what it is, which to me is extremely, it's just so exciting to read. And then um, I actually went into the university archives um, for the year that she was a student, so um, 1895, and I managed to build out her entire schedule. So she was in a Greek tragedy class. Um, her professor actually at one point, like she got the top score in her whole class and she had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her professor who told her that she had serious promise in the classics and like, you know, she should like go forth with it, which was really exciting since, you know, she studied so much, like she clearly deserves it. So I found her geometry classes and um, I could see who taught them. I could see what time they were worth. So that was, that was really fun. And then this picture right here um, is not of um, Edda Mickey or her friends, but um, was a few years later in 1920. It's a group of men and women going on a hike together in Wildcat Canyon. And I go up and hike there frequently. And I think that this, you know, maybe could be an example of what her and her friends kind of looked like on a day off in the Berkeley um, Hills together. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, and now we're going to talk about, you know, we just talked about all the pioneering women. We talked a lot about the history of women. And now we're going to dive into some of the earlier, more modern achievements of Berkeley women. And I wanted to start with these 1960s. And in the 19, um, I'm sorry, the 1950s. And in the 1950s, women were still going to school for one main reason. Um, there was a generalization that women were going to college in order to get an education so that they could marry into a higher class. It was a way for them to go up the social hierarchy in a sense. And so that's something that was really prevalent at the time of families sending their daughters to school um, so that they could marry into a higher stature. But there were also people that questioned that status quo. One of the examples is Joan Didion. Joan Didion during her time here at Cal actually wrote an article for the Daily Californian on that exact phenomenon that was happening on campus. And she started to change the whole conversation. And it was her that actually kind of pivoted people. Okay, no, we're here to get an education. You know, look at these phenomenal Berkeley women that came before us. You know, at the end of the day, that's our goal here. And so that was very fundamental. And other people at the same time were also similar change makers. We had Marion Diamond, um, who's been pivotal, pivotal research in modern neuroscience. Um, she's really well known for discovering the plasticity of the brain. And she's actually really well known for her research on actually Albert Einstein's brain. And we also have here Herma Hay Kay. And Herma Hay Kay was a Bolt faculty member back in the 1960s. And she actually co-drafted California's 1970 no-fault divorce law. And she closely worked with Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the 1960s and 70s when they co-authored together the first case against sex discrimination in the workplace. And so we started to have these phenomenal strong change makers come out as they continue to leave their legacy here at Berkeley. 
Now jumping into the 1960s, at the very beginning of the 1960s, we start to see this um, thing called slate activism come up, which was a precursor for the free speech movement. And during slate activism, a lot of the men were starting to have protests go on those front lines. And women believed that they were getting more gendered tasks where they were being told to, you know, cook the food, bring the men, you know, drinks on the front lines of the protests, you know, clean, get flyers out. Um, and so it was very gendered. However, slowly over time, as women were getting more and more involved in this activism on campus, they were starting to not only fight for the causes they cared about, but uplift each other. And so eventually at this Hewick protest, about 25% of the people involved were women. And they were starting to get at the front of these lines. And it was really exciting then a couple years later during the free speech movement, when women actually had a seat at the table. You'll see in the picture in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see two men and two women at a table. And those two women are Bettina Aptheker and Jackie Goldberg. And they got to actually talk alongside men. They brought up their issues. They gave huge speeches. They signed contracts with um, local organizations. And they really fought for not just free speech for all, but also fought for women's rights alongside that. And now I want to talk about some of the female leaders of today. And what's really kind of interesting is we've always had this um, kind of environment here at Berkeley where activism and politics are always on the minds of students. You know, how can we fight for what we believe in? And what's really special is today, we actually have two Berkeley women that are currently presiding in uh, Biden's cabinet, which is very exciting to have representation, a part of like the US president's office. And we have Jennifer Granholm, who is Secretary of Energy. And she's actually taught classes here at Berkeley about clean energy, policy innovation, and communication. And then we also have Janet Yellen here, who's his Secretary of Treasury, and she's out of our Haas School of Business. And she's also a famous economist. And as an economics major myself, um, it's very, very proud to be able to see a Berkeley woman holding all the different positions she has. She has been a trailblazer and influential teacher here. She's the first woman to serve as Secretary of Treasury. She was also the first woman to serve as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and the first woman to chair the Federal Reserve. So she is actually the first person in American history to hold all three of those very influential spots in our economy. Continuing to talk about the famous leaders today, we've had so many firsts on our Berkeley campus, you know, in the last few years. One of them being we've had our first ever female chancellor, Chancellor Christ, um, who has done phenomenal work on our campus and has been such a strong supporter of our 150 years of Women at Berkeley celebration. We've also had our first Dean of Engineering, uh, Sue J. Lin, who has been pioneering a lot of the work in the engineering and tech space. And we've also had our first African-Americans women's basketball coach, um, Sharman Smith. And you'll see her photo in the lower uh, left-hand side of the screen. And it's not just our leaders that have had first, we've also had some amazing firsts in our STEM research here on campus. One being Jill Banfield. So Jill Banfield actually discovered the new tree of life, which is the foundation of evolutionary biology. And she worked closely with Jennifer Doudna. And Jennifer Doudna just received her Nobel Prize last year in 2020 in chemistry for her work discovering CRISPR. And so for me as a current student here at Berkeley, being able to see all these phenomenal leaders and being able to see their impact not only inspires me, but it also shows me, you know, what can be achieved. Um, and that's something I'm really grateful to be on a campus that not only supports, but that celebrates it. And I just wanted to take a little time to reflect. You know, when we started this presentation, we started by telling you about this resolution that on October 3rd of 1870, the UC Regents approved a resolution that stated that young ladies would be admitted into the university on equal terms in all respects with young men. And when I think about that resolution, that really made the change in Berkeley history. It was that, that specific event and the achievements of women that came after 
that made the achievements of our current Berkeley women and our own possible. And I think it's important for us to be able to recognize that and for us to continue to have that change maker mentality, you know, that Berkeley has so much ingrained within us so that we can continue to pave the path for the future generations so that we can give back what others have given us. And the other thing I wanted to mention is on the right hand side, you'll see our 150W logo. And if you look really closely, you'll see it's made up of by over 1500 headshots of Berkeley women and allies from the Berkeley community. And um, it was a project that I was really involved in this last year. And as a student, I'm the first woman in my family to go to college and having the opportunity to see all the different women involved in our community and allies and being able to put all of that together into this larger picture made me realize just how important it was to not just celebrate all genders, but uplift each other and show us how strong our community is and how strong we are together. And it's something I'm really grateful to have participated in. And now you're probably wondering, you know, okay, we've heard about the history, we've heard about the current women, how are you celebrating 150 years of women at Berkeley? So our celebration was a joint effort between the administration and the academic senate that was sponsored by the office of the chancellor. And it was spearheaded by our executive committee. And you'll see a photo of some of our executive committee members um, on this slide. You'll see Jill, who is our direct, the director of the tech initiative in the UC system. You'll see LaDawn Duval, our executive director of visitor and parent services. You'll see Chancellor Christ right next to her. And then you'll see Oliver O'Reilly, who was the academic senate chair and is a professor of mechanical engineering. And it was one of the best opportunities I've ever had in my undergraduate career to be surrounded by such phenomenal individuals and to be able to push and spearhead this celebration alongside them. We also had a history project that was led by Sheila Humphreys and Catherine Gallagher. And they worked to collect, create, and archive so much information about the rich history of the contributions of women to UC Berkeley. We also have an art project in the works um, currently, women art is not as represented on Berkeley's campus as we would like, and so that is an initiative to change that. Um, also, a huge shout out to athletics. In that photo above, you will see our women's basketball team all holding hands um, and building a bridge together. And that's actually where we had our launch event for our 150 years of Women at Berkeley celebration back in January of 2020 at the Cal versus Stanford women's basketball game. And it was definitely a fun celebration. And then I also just wanna take note of some of our logos that you'll see on this left-hand side. You know, this celebration, yes, was also celebrating women, but also celebrating all gender diversity and all genders that we've had represented on our campus. Because I think when we look back into the 1870s, when that resolution was passed for women, it started to pave the way for more acceptance later on. And I'm really glad that on our campus, we're able to have all genders represented and be able to celebrate them included in this um, event as well. And I also just want to give a huge thank you to all of you currently listening to this presentation, to all of you that have contributed to the celebration, that have supported it, um, it wouldn't have been possible or as successful if it wasn't because of you. So a huge, huge thank you. This is this was just so wonderful, and I feel like I wish we were um, able to kind of see everyone watching because I know both of you, Brianna and Christy, would be met with thunderous applause right now. I know I'm applauding internally because that was just such an incredible overview of the history of women at Berkeley. So thank you so much for your presentation. And we will kind of transition into some questions, um, if that's all right with you all. So we did have our very first question, and I'll turn this over to Christy. Um, as you were researching on all of this, what was the most interesting part of your research? And what was the most challenging part of it, if you want to share? I think the most interesting parts were 
the diaries. And um, something that was very interesting was um, I was just starting to read uh, the women's, um, the women had their own council starting in, I think it was like the 1920s, the 1930s. And I just had gotten my hands on their log book, which was like this thick and it was fascinating stuff. And that very day was the day that Canvas announced that it was going to be shutting down temporarily. So I actually never really got my hands back on that log book, but someday I hope maybe to come back as a graduate and read through it just for my own personal interest because they had just fascinating accounts of various like conflicts that they solved for women students. So that would have been very interesting, but really the diaries and the personal accounts. And then going into that, the challenges, honestly, like reading the cursive was so challenging, um, especially with Edda McHugh's diary from, you know, the 1890s. I probably spent a couple hours, I mean, when I first got it, I, I almost handed it back to the library and I was like, I can't read this, I'm so sorry. Um, but I worked on it and it took me a few hours just to be able to interpret. Um, and I got pretty good and I started, you know, really chugging through it, but that was very challenging. Yeah, I can imagine. But again, it's just so exciting that you were able to get so much done and um, learn so much like you did. Um, I'll move on to our second question, which I'll turn over to Brianna. Um, why does the 150W celebration excite you? Um, what drew you to this project? Oh, that's such a great question. Thank you to whoever asked that. I think for me personally, you know, I'm the first woman in my family to go to college. And so something that definitely excited me about the project and drew me to it is the fact that I'd be celebrating Berkeley women that came before me. And that was something that I was always kind of drawn to in college. I'm a part of a lot of um, women groups on campus, like Britannian Women's Honor Society, Berkeley Women in Business, Greek Life, et cetera. And it was, it's always been such an uplifting community. And so when I was given the opportunity to be able to join the celebration, I was so excited. Um, I am so thankful to actually LaDawn Duvall, who is our uh, executive director of visitor and parent services for giving me the opportunity, you know, to come on board, um, because it's definitely been the highlight of my undergraduate career. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Brianna. Um, our next question is from Navia, who asks, what is something you hope to see moving forward for women at Cal? And either of you can answer this. I think I can jump in first and feel free, Christy, to jump in too. I think, you know, we've made so much progress, you know, in the last few decades for women, but I think there's still areas of improvement. You know, two areas that jump out at me are uh, women represented in finance and women represented in tech. I think those are both areas that we are making, you know, strong um, positive movements in, but I think there's still areas where we can strengthen women representation. And so when I think about what I hope for next is I hope to have, you know, a 50-50 split and more gender representation um, in those areas. And I think Berkeley can play a pivotal role there. I feel very similarly. And I wanted to chime in one of, actually one of the most important pieces of kind of history I think I was able to unearth was this idea that so many early college, you know, grads and Berkeley students included, Berkeley women were STEM majors because STEM was seen as less prestigious initially than getting like a law degree or getting a philosophy degree. And so like the fact that we don't see women in STEM today as much is really not because of anything related to the field, but specifically because of the exit opportunities and prestige associated with the field. So it's just like that, that's really exemplified that even more for me in thinking like this is really a social issue. This is absolutely nothing to do with like um, math or science. Actually, this is just how these areas are perceived according to gender. Yeah, I'm so glad you both touched on that because I know that um, in looking at like the history of women at Cal, it's also important to think about what that might imply for the future. So um, thank you both for sharing. And then um, one of our first questions was for Christy. Someone asked um, if you could elaborate on the photo that was gone over in one of the slides on where classes were registered for and if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I think with Julia DuPont's account, so this was, 
1920s, I would imagine that her class registration, so Wheeler Hall was built in 1917, and there was a bunch of those big kind of like neoclassical um, buildings at the time, we'll get like the Campanile, we'll get like the Hearst Mining Hall, like all those built by John Galen Howard, you know, the kind of architect of many famous Berkeley landmarks. Um, so I'd like to imagine possibly it would have been in Wheeler Hall, since that was like one of the main gathering spaces and still like was the biggest lecture hall and still is pretty much like the biggest lecture hall we have on campus. Um, but moving in more into the 1940s, which is the photo that I was able to unearth online. Um, I, I'm not sure it might have been Wheeler Hall. It might have been, I know at the time because of World War II and expansion that a lot of kind of temporary buildings were built. So we get kind of like these temporary study spaces um, on the Glade used to be kind of uh, covered with um, these sort of portable temporary buildings for expanded space. So I'm wondering maybe they would have registered for classes in these kind of more temporary buildings that we don't have yet. Um, also, I've seen a bunch of photos from the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s of student registration outside, so on Sproul Plaza. Um, and I, you know, started school in 2017 here at Cal and we've always done it online. So I don't even know what that would feel like or look like, um, but it could have been outside as well in some outdoor location. Thank you so much for sharing. And this is also a little bit of um, a technical question about some of the topics you discussed in the slides, Christy, but um, we were also wondering if you have any more stories about Etta McHugh and any of the diaries that you read that you might wanna share. Oh yes, I, I I just loved reading her accounts. She was so vibrant and I keep a diary myself. So I was very like inspired kind of by her accounts and like maybe someone in a hundred years will be reading my accounts as a student at Berkeley. Um, so one of the really interesting accounts, um, I really enjoyed reading about her studying and her study groups, especially. I think I kind of touched on this, but um, she was part of the um, Young um, Women's Christian Association, which is still a, um, you know, so, you know, building an association that we have here. So she put on a bunch of different events with them and um, she went to this or was going to go to this Valentine's Day dance or social and she kind of decided that she didn't really like the guy that much who asked her and she needed to study for a Latin exam and she's like I'm staying home like I'm not going to this social and I thought that was super just cool where her priorities were at and where she was staying. Um, another interesting story. So she spent a great deal of time trying to start a guitar club on campus and she was a big guitar player. And so she put up signs everywhere and she's like very, really nervous. She's like, what if nobody comes to my guitar club? And she like bakes cookies and muffins for her guitar club. And um, on the first day, um, like two people show up and one of them is like one of her professors and they all just kind of like sit around and jam on the guitar together. And I thought that was a really fun, you know, image from the late 1800s, just these students, you know, sitting, like eating, after class like playing guitar with like a professor that joined their guitar club that's amazing it's just it's great to be able to hear all of this and the fact that you did all of this research and you're so knowledgeable it's just great to hear again like you said an insight of like the daily small details of um, their lives um sorry another question for christy um angel asks Will we be able to read some of Christie's research papers in the future? I really, really wish, um, but I actually haven't written them except um, I have rough drafts of the very first couple from the early 1800s. Um, my research was really based on access to the university archives and because of COVID, I had to move home and was not able to access campus. And I understand that you can access the libraries as of late um, with special research appointments, but unfortunately I'm graduating in five weeks. Um, so somebody else will have to pick up the torch and hopefully maybe they can see this presentation and be inspired. There's a lot of fascinating fascinating accounts, diaries, letters that people haven't really read in a long time. So hopefully someone can kind of pick it up. But this presentation is really going to be sort of the end point of my research. Yeah, and I think it's it's a wonderful thing to be able to share with everyone. And I'm glad that this will be recorded for many more people to visit in the future. Um, our next question, I'll turn over to Brianna. One of our attendees asks, do you have any advice for high school seniors as they choose a college? That's a good question. If you didn't know, Christy and I are both campus ambassadors. And so we often talk to prospective students um, that are trying to make a decision on college. The best piece of advice I always share with everyone is just apply. If there's a school that you've ever thought of, apply. 
the worst thing they can say is no. And that was the best advice I got from a college counselor. She had me apply to over 20 schools. And I remember going back to her and I got into about, I got into 21. And I remember telling her like, how do I make this decision? And she said, I don't know, but you got in. <laughs> and so um, then I remember going to a coffee shop and like scrolling through colleges and being able to make that decision for myself. And so what I tell high school seniors now is it's worth applying. You know, if you don't know a lot about a school, but you recognize the name, if it's a reach, um, always go for it um, because you never know what might happen. How about you, Christy? Do you have any advice for high school seniors? Yeah, in a, in a similar vein, um, look look at, you know, uh, what you'd like to do, like where you want to be after college and try to figure out what school is going to put you in that position, um, I think is an excellent, excellent advice. Um, yeah, great job. <laughs> Yeah, thank you both so much. And um, I did want to say, I know we've gotten a bunch of questions, but we do have a limited amount of time. So I'd encourage everyone, if they have remaining questions, to email um, 150w at berkeley.edu, and someone will get, to, get back to you with an answer to your question. But thank you both, Brianna and Christy, for your answers. And I'm going to just share a few resources for all of our participants. So if you'll just bear with me for a moment. Alrighty. So we did want to leave everyone with a link to our 150 Years of Women website, 150w.berkeley.edu. Um, and if you're interested in checking out one of our virtual campus visits, um, check out visit.berkeley.edu to hear more from Brianna and Christy and all of us um, campus ambassadors. You can follow us on Instagram at visit UC Berkeley and um, at women at Cal 150. And again, please email 150w at berkeley.edu with any questions um, for the 150w team. Um, you can also check out beartalk.berkeley.edu for a student run um, blog showcasing Berkeley stories. And we also offer a U visit tour, which is like a 360 degree tour of the campus for anyone interested at uvisit.com slash Berkeley. Um, but thank you so much again, Christy and Brianna for answering all those questions. I think we do have a video to share with everyone, just kind of celebrating what women are doing now. Um, so I wanted to play that for us all to watch and listen to. Wonderful. And again, I just wanted to thank Brianna and Christy for such a wonderful presentation and everyone who came today to learn a little bit more at, about women at Cal. Um, and we tend to end our virtual visits with a classic Go Bears. Um, so I think it's still appropriate to do so now. So if Christy and Brianna would unmute themselves, we can end with a Go Bears on three, one, two, three. Go Bears! Go Bears! <laughs> Thank you, everyone.